Hi guys, Mr. Perley again. We uh, ended our first video on Chapter 9, uh, the uh, Middle Ages, the emergence of the Middle Ages and the Byzantine Empire with feudalism. And we left here with the uh, feudal uh, estate, so to speak. We're going to go now and change gears and look at some early kingdoms, primarily in England and in France. Okay. Early governments in France after the fall of the Roman Empire, there are many attempts to try and make new empires in Western Europe. Okay. Uh, Clovis, you may recall from this book, uh, is the guy who his wife was nagging him to become a Christian because she's a Christian and he says, I don't want to do that. And then he, he prays to Jesus for help before a battle, wins a battle, and he becomes a Christian. Well, he gains support in doing so of the Western Catholic Church and the Catholic Church, and that's going to help him out. Now, the problem in uh, Western Europe here is we have a lot of warrior rulers, but they're not really good administrators, okay? And they actually leave the administration in charge of these guys they refer to as the mayors of the palace. Now, the mayors of the palace, these are like an advisor. But these advisors eventually sort of take charge of things. In fact, Pepin the Short, the uh, son of Charles Martel, he's the guy who defeats the Muslims at the Battle of Tours in 732, uh, stopping their halt into Western Europe after they'd taken over Portugal and Spain. Well, uh, Pepin the Short was one of those mayors of the palace. He gets crowned by the Pope, thereby the Pope sort of showing again his power over him. Okay, this is part of Pepin's empire. In fact, he's sort of this central region up in this region here at the time. Okay, Pepin's son will eventually take over in 768. He's known as Charles the Great. That's this guy right here. You might know him by his other name, however, which was Charlemagne. And Charlemagne uh, builds the in Western and Central Europe. Uh, he rules until 814 and builds the largest empire in Europe from, since the fall of Rome until Napoleon. He is, of course, the king of the Franks. Okay? He is crowned uh, the Roman, uh, uh, emperor of the Romans in 800 by the Pope. Uh, something he didn't know was going to happen. Didn't like that, actually, because, again, he doesn't like the idea of the Pope trying to sort assert authority over him. Now, this is the size of the Frankish Empire by the end of Charlemagne. Uh, you can actually, this is a map if you want to freeze this. You can see the Frankish territories in the Clovis conquest, and then we have conquests of Charlemagne and dependent territories. Massive empires you can see all the way down to Rome, into Eastern Europe, all the way uh, to the Pyrenees Mountains here. Now, over in England, things are a little bit different. Uh, we have those in the 500s, Angles and Saxons, those dramatic tribes uh, from Denmark and Germany who settle into Britain. Uh, their voyages over and uh, occupation takes place kind of like we see here on the map. And then later, the Norman invasion will take place in Great Britain. Uh, this happens in 1066. Remember those Vikings who had invaded into Europe, and uh, then the French got so tired of invading, they actually did in their own area, which was Normans, uh, which we said later was Normandy, where you know the D-Day invasions were. Well, William of Normandy, better known to me as William the Conqueror, uh, defeats the English at the Battle of Hastings in 1066 and becomes the King of England, at least for a little while. This is the sort of the Battle of Hastings. He arrives literally in the early September, uh, mid-September. Uh, some ups and downs in the battles, but essentially on October 14th at the Battle of Hastings, he defeats Harold, uh, the current King of England. Uh, and on Christmas Day in 1066, he is crowned the king. For a short time, he later gives it to his son. He goes back to France to rule over there. Okay. This is a image from uh, the battle at the Battle of Hastings. This is from the Bayou Tapestry. Okay, uh, the Normans will take steps to create a very strong central monarchy. However, in England, they'll make all the nobles swear allegiance to the king. That idea, that feudal idea of swearing allegiance. They take over all the governmental institutions and they conduct a census, a full census of people, animals, and land. They want to know what all their assets are. Why? tax purposes. Okay, here is another scene from the Bayou Tapestry. There's uh, William the Conqueror now as King of England, at least for that short time, the nobles swearing allegiance to him. And this, this is the Doomsday Book, that census I mentioned earlier. 
Going on, we see some kings begin to take more and more power in England, and the nobles, those local lords who had been having power in the feudal pyramid, start to feel taken, well, advantage of. And so they start to rebel a little bit. Now, in 1215 at Runimede, they make King John, uh, they forced him to sign the Magna Carta, the Great Charter. Okay, This is a copy of the Great Charter, if we go to the... Um, uh, British Museum in London. You can see that there in the documents room, several copies of it, in fact. Uh, now, really, John is the brother of King Richard, who was uh, king before him. He was a guy, Richard the Lionhearted. Uh, John's referred to as Lackland because he didn't inherit any lands, lack of lands, Lackland. Um, he uh, later becomes king, but is so despised by the king's other folks, the other nobles, that's why he's forced to sign the Magna Carta. Now, the Magna Carta was originally designed to guarantee the nobles' rights, okay? And eventually, however, it will come to guarantee everyone's rights in England. Okay? The nobles used the Magna Carta to limit the king. What he had to do was ask them to raise taxes or raise money, usually. And I say usually because they find all kinds of ways around it. They'll tax the church, they'll tax other people, they'll tax the towns, people who aren't part of the feudal pyramid, they try to find ways around it every time that they possibly can. Um, this uh, becomes a council of nobles that he has to ask to raise those taxes, however, and this is them here, sort of the king up front, these nobles coming at court to advise him. Well, this later becomes something that meets regularly and becomes actually permanent. This is parliament that develops during the reign, really, of Edward. The first. This is Edward the first here. Perhaps you know him from his role in Braveheart. Uh, he's Edward Longshanks. Uh, he's the guy who uh, battled with um, William and Bruce, who's the King of Scotland, and of course ending up with fighting Braveheart himself. Uh, we'll be back with another short video, this one dealing with religion.